prayer tonight, and then we'll get started. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come into your house tonight. Father, we thank you for the words that you give us. We thank you for the things that you've done for us. And so we ask now, Lord, tonight as we study your word, as we see the things that will come about, as we see your, your coming back for your people, Lord, help us to understand and help us to know, Lord, and just help us to uh, just get wisdom from the things that we learn tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so um, we're going to be in Revelation 19. We're going to continue this lesson tonight, Revelation 19. We're going to continue looking at this. Uh, last week we started looking at Jesus Christ coming back. So last week we started looking at him coming back. I'm going to read a few verses that we uh, read last week just to kind of get you back to where we were. We were seeing that this was Jesus coming back for the second time. It says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he, makes, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And so last week what we looked at was we looked at these, um, these verses, and we saw that this was Jesus Christ. So we saw that these verses were describing Jesus Christ. We, we looked at why, and we looked at the evidence, and, and we saw that because of all these words and all the things that were said, that this was definitely Jesus Christ coming back. We looked at the difference between the rapture, us being taken to heaven, and we looked at the and him coming back with all of us with him. And so tonight, as we get into this, we're going to see that uh, when Jesus Christ comes back, he has some folks with him, and we're going to start out by looking at who he has with him, his army, and then we're going to look at what happens when he comes back. But remember, this is the second coming, so this is a little different. This is Jesus coming back to earth the, the last time, I guess you call it the second time, as conqueror. This is not him rapturing his church. So just remember that as we look at these verses tonight. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight is his army. And we're going to be looking at verse 14 for that. Verse 14 says this, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So the first thing we see is we see Jesus... Uh, heaven opening up we see Jesus coming down as we see Jesus coming down as this great conqueror the second thing the Bible tells us in Revelation is that he's not by himself For, verse 14 says in the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses so when Jesus is coming back he's coming with his army he returns with the armies of heaven but the the question becomes then is well who are the armies of heaven who, who's coming back with Jesus who are these people People that are being, going to be back with him. And so as we get into this tonight and we look at who these people are, uh, I want to remind you of why some of these are. So I believe, that this is my belief, and I, I believe we've gone through this, and we have um, evidence from the Bible for this, that the church will be raptured before the tribulation happens, so the church will be in heaven prior to the tribulation. And because of that, I believe that at the time of all the tribulation, the, the church is in heaven. So when they come back down, when, they come, when Jesus Christ comes back, I believe one group of people that will be with Jesus Christ will be the raptured church. I believe the church will be with Jesus Christ. Those that were in the rapture that have gone to heaven, I believe they will come back with him. And so I believe you're going to see, you'll see several different groups come back with Jesus Christ in this armies in heaven. And I believe the first one is the rapture church. If you go back up to verse 8, in chapter 19 it says and to her the church it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints well if you go back to verse 14 it says the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean so I believe that gives us some evidence that the one group of people with this army of God that's coming back are going to be all of us that know Jesus Christ now, that will be raptured to heaven, will spend tribulation period in heaven, and then when Jesus Christ comes back, we will be with him, following him on the white horses. I believe the second group that we see here are those that are saved in the tribulation period. So we know that the church will be raptured. That's my belief. The church will be raptured before the tribulation happens. 
But we also know that during that seven years tribulation period, during that seven year time, we know that many, many, I believe millions of people will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. We know that the Jewish people will have uh, witnesses that come and witness to them and there'll be a large number of Jewish people turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. The Bible shows us that there'll be others that turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. And so all of those people that were saved in the tribulation period that died during that time. So remember, seven years of tribulation period, there's going to be famine, there's going to be war, there's going to be demonic attacks, and there's going to be the Antichrist declaring war on all of God's people, and it says that he will prevail. What that means is that he's going to kill countless number of Christians. Well, all of those that are saved in the tribulation, because they knew Jesus Christ, they will go to heaven when they die. They will be sent to heaven, and I believe that they will be part of this group, that, the armies that come back down with God. Look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, when it describes these people. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one can number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with, with palm branches in their hands. And so if you go back, his army is described as wearing these fine linen robes. And so I believe that this group of people seen in Revelation 7, the tribulation, saved in tribulation, will come back down with him as well. The third group of people that will be in his army that I believe as he comes back will be the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints. Those from the Old Testament that found favor with God, had faith in God, were called to righteousness because of God, because of their faith, and that God has shown us in the Bible that these Old Testament saints, I believe they will be part of this army as well. I'll show you some verses there. Jude chapter Jude verse 14. No chapters in Jude, Jude verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. Old Testament saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands, ten thousands of his saints. And then we see in Daniel chapter 12, At that time Michael shall stand up, this is the archangel, the great prince who stands and watch over the sons of your people, Israel, the son of your people, Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, there we go. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, those who have already passed on, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So those Israelites, the Old Testament saints that have gone before, that are in heaven, they will come back with God, with Jesus Christ also. And the final group of his army will be the angels of heaven. I believe the angels of heaven will be the final group. Look at what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And in 2 Thessalonians it says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so we see Jesus Christ saying he's going to come back with his angels. And so this army of heaven, just imagine this picture for a second if you will. You've got Jesus Christ arrayed in all of his glory leading the charge. And as he comes down from heaven, and the Bible tells us that this great army is following him. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And so I, I don't know how many people this is going to be, okay? What it's going to look like. But imagine Jesus Christ coming down and behind him, basically the entirety of heaven coming down with him at this time coming down from the, the, from the sky, from heaven. It's going to be a glorious sight for those that know Jesus Christ, but it's going to be a horrible sight for the armies that are camped out ready to wage war against Jesus Christ when they see this. And so, always, I guess, two sides of the coin. But you're going to see these, these people that come, all these people come down from heaven with Jesus Christ. I want to show you some other verses. Zechariah 14, 5. Look at what it says. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach, shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with him. So in Zechariah he was prophesying what will happen. 
Thessalonians 3.13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. So I think it's pretty clear, according to the Bible, that when Jesus Christ comes down, all of his saints, all of his angels, the Old Testament, everyone that has been saved uh, will be coming down with Jesus Christ when he comes down from heaven the second time. Like I said, going to be a glorious sight, but at the same time, it's going to be uh, a sight of fear for those who have gone against Jesus Christ. Because look what happens next. Next we see his judgment and his rule in verse 15 and 16. Now this is talking about Jesus again. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so here we see why he's coming to earth. He's coming for judgment and for rule. The first verse in 15, I think we've heard this a lot, that out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. Here's what it's telling us. It's telling us that his words are his weapon. Jesus Christ does not need a physical sword. Jesus Christ, his words are his weapon. Remember, when this earth was created, when everything was created, it was created with a spoken word. When God created everything, he created it with a spoken word. What makes us think that he can't destroy with a spoken word as well? And so when he comes down from heaven, the sharp sword, described as two edges in other translations, this two-edged sword, it comes forth from his mouth. It's his words, his speech, his talk. It symbolizes the power of the words of Jesus Christ. If he can speak the world into creation... If he can speak and give comfort to people while he was walking on earth. If he can raise the dead with a, with a word. If he can calm a storm with a word. What makes us think that when he comes down, he can't destroy armies with a single word that comes out of his mouth? And that's what we're seeing here. His word is a sharp two-edged sword. And it says that he would strike the nations with it. If you notice, it doesn't say anything about his armies, all of us coming back. It doesn't look like we're going to be carrying any weapons. We don't need any. We have Jesus Christ in front of us, protecting us and taking care of us and destroying all that is before him and judging all that is before him. And then it goes on to say, say that he himself, Jesus Christ, will be the rule, will be the one that rules. So he'll strike down the nations. And then he will rule the nations. He and he alone will be the conqueror. And he and he alone will be the ruler. Remember, at this point, Antichrist has been set up on earth. He's been ruling. He has had his ten kings that we're going to talk about in a minute, ruling the earth with him. He's had this false prophet running deception everywhere. But now Jesus Christ will come and he will strike down all the nations. And then he will rule. And not only will he rule, he will rule with a rod of iron. What does that mean? That means that he will rise rightly and justly right and through righteousness and through holiness he will judge and instantly put down the rebellion that's been happening on earth since adam and eve ate in the garden and so he will rule there will be no there will be no other rebellion after this jesus christ will rule and it says that finally it says he himself jesus christ treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god when it says he himself there rules and he himself treads, it's shown us that only Jesus Christ is worthy and capable of doing these things. So what does that mean? That means that only God has given Jesus the right to judge. Only God has given Jesus, only Jesus has the right to pour out that wrath of the Almighty God, the wine press, a picture of the grapes being pressed and destroyed to make wine. So this is what we're seeing coming down from heaven. This is what we're seeing with Jesus Christ. And then in verse 16, it shows us his title. Verse 16 shows us his title. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So when Jesus was crucified and he was hanging on the cross, do you remember what Pilate had put above him? King of the Jews. And so when Jesus was killed, when Jesus uh, was sacrificed, the rulers of the world at that time looked at him and said, and mocked him, really saying that he was the king of the Jews. 
But when Jesus comes back the second time, he will proclaim his true title and who he truly is. He will proclaim himself, and he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now remember, once again, at this time, he's coming down to face the armies of the earth that have come out to battle him. And so when he comes down from heaven, all of these people that are out here to fight him have been worshiping the beast. They're, they're all in on the Antichrist and Satan. They've, they've given him all their, uh, all their allegiance. The Antichrist has all power and authority on earth. Then all of a sudden, heaven's going to break open. Jesus Christ is going to come down with his armies of heaven and on his robe and on his thigh. And if you think about it, if it's on his thigh and he is riding a horse, with his, uh, he's riding a horse, the, the wording on his thigh is going to be very evident of what it says and what people see. They will be able to see it from a distance and it will say, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is coming back to show his sovereignty. He's coming back to show his rule. He will leave no doubt in the mind of the people and let them know that he truly is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When he left earth, they mocked him as the King of the Jews, but when he comes back, he will be King of everything. He will be Lord of everything. And people will, will see this as he comes back with his army and it's inscribed on his. And the, the title that he has will show his sovereignty. And then we see something that we talk about a lot in this world. We hear about a lot. But the Bible really doesn't talk about it a whole lot. So we hear about this great battle at the end of time. We hear about the battle of Armageddon and there's verses in the Bible that, that talk about where this battle is going to be in the, the Valley of Megiddo there and they call it the battle of Armageddon and it's when Jesus Christ and Satan have their final showdown. But really, as we read these verses tonight, we're going to see that God really doesn't spend a whole lot of time on this. Not as much as man does. Man spends a whole lot of time talking about this battle of Armageddon and all that's going to happen and how it's going to decide the fate of the world and everything. But look at what God has to say about this battle and look what really happens at this battle. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. This is John talking to us once again. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the, all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the, sup, for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So if you read this, not much of a battle. You hear and see about this great battle, but it was over before it ever started. How do we know that? Well, the first thing we see in these verses is we see an angel standing in the sun. So the angel is going to be up above the world where all can see him, where everybody can see him, and he's going to proclaim with a loud voice. And look what he says. He's not talking to man. He's not talking to God. He's not talking to the armies of the earth. He is talking to the birds of the air. The birds that fly in the midst of heaven. He's calling out to them. And look at what he says to them. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat. And we won't go into all this again. But he is telling the birds. He's like, there's getting ready to be a great feast for you because we're going to kill that everybody out here is going to be dead. Before the battle even started, before anything happened, the angels are already proclaiming the victor. Who is going to be victorious in this battle? An angel proclaims the feast. No one is exempt from this. Look at what it says. The kings, the captains, the mighty men, the horses, those who sit on them, the flesh of all people, free and slave, both great and both small and great. Because here's what happens. In verse 19 it says, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. This is the end of the tribulation period. 
Okay? There is nothing left really after this. Your seven years is basically up. This is Jesus Christ coming back. At the end of the tribulation period, there are only, there are only two groups of people left on earth. You got all the people that have followed Jesus Christ that are still alive, that are in hiding, as we saw earlier, as Jesus, as God gives them sanctuary where Satan can't touch them. You got all of them, and then you got everybody else on the face of the earth at this point, in my opinion, has taken the, the mark of the beast. They are deceived by the Antichrist, and they are serving him 100%. Okay? Here's the other thing to remember. At this point in the seven years, you've had every, every wrath of God, every judgment of God. You've had the demons come and destroy. You've had Satan come and destroy. And so there's not going to be many people left on earth at this time in my belief. I don't believe there will be that many people. I say all that to say that basically everyone that's left is going to be here to battle God. There may be people scattered throughout the earth a little bit, but for the majority of the people that are left on earth, I believe they're going to be here and they're going to come and in their arrogance and in their belief in Satan, they are going to come and they are going to wage war against God. Now, I don't know what Satan is going to tell them. I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this. They're going to believe that they can win a war against God. They're going to believe that they can fight God. That's the reason I said the, the armies here, when they see Jesus Christ come down, it, it's going to have to be a horrifying scene for them to see. But for the rest of the earth, those, that, those few that are left that have followed him, it's going to be glorious. And verse 19 kind of tells us who it is. Verse 19 starts out with the beast. So the beast is the Antichrist. The beast is the one who Satan has given the power to to rule the world during this time. Then you have the kings of the earth. These are ten kings that will lead the Antichrist ten kingdoms that he will set up at the end of time. So you've got his ten kingdoms, the kings of the earth, his, his ten kingdoms. All their armies, so basically every remaining army on the earth will be here. So you've got all the armies. And they come to make war. Now, they come to make war, and we see here that it's not much of a battle. In verse 20, we see that there really is no battle here in verse 20. The first thing you see in verse 20 is that the beast was captured. It doesn't tell us how, doesn't tell us who. My, my thinking is that it has to be an angel that's going to capture the beast. Angels, armies, of God, God's, angels are coming down with his army. The beast and with him, the false prophet, I believe the angels will be the one that will capture them. And look, it says that these two were cast alive in the lake of burning fire with brimstone. And so what we see here is we see these two people captured and then immediately punished. The greatest leader that the world has seen, the Antichrist, who brought the entire world together and deceived people with his false prophet, they come up against Jesus Christ. He will capture them immediately. He will cast them alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And so we see these two get their punishment for what they've done. But the sad thing about it is this is not, they're not going to be the only two that are cast in here. We're going to see this later on where the rest of those that rebel. We'll see this again in later chapters. But think about what an awful end to these two that have come and done unspeakable crimes. They will have torment forever in the lake of fire, heat, brimstone, the, the unable to breathe, the sulfur smell, unable to breathe there. And forever and ever, they will burn. And so we see here what has happened to, the, uh, to those who have gone against God. And then in verse 21, to end the battle, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And so, very direct here, we see that there was no war. There really wasn't even a battle. Jesus Christ spoke a word and it was over. I mentioned it earlier. He could create the world with a, the with a voice. But think about it this way. When he was on earth walking, he also spoke a single word to a fig tree. And what happened to the fig tree? was cursed, never brought forth fruit again. He found a man that was full of demons, and with the word, what happened to all the demons? They were cast out. They were gone. He was on a boat, 
And the waves were going up and down and the people, the, the apostles on the boat came and they woke him up. They were afraid. And he got up and he spoke to the winds and the waves and what happened? Complete calm. And so we see over and over and over and over again the power of God's words. We see over and over again the power of God word, His words. And then in verse 21 we see the real power of His words when it comes to judgment. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. All it did was, a, was he spoke. He was coming down from heaven. The armies of the earth are gathered in this valley just as far as the eye can see to face Jesus Christ and his armies coming down. His angels, I don't know how it's going to play out, but here's my theory. His angels kind of go ahead. They capture the beast. They capture the prophet. They bring, they bring them to, God, to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ speaks a word. We don't know what he's going to say. But he's going to say something. And when he says it, the entire army is killed in an instant because of his words. The rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from his mouth. His words. There is no battle. There is no fight. There is nothing like that. The battle is completely over with a word from Jesus Christ. I want you all to think about that for a second. Think about how powerful this shows the word of, God, the word of God, the Word of Christ to be. I want you to think about what this shows us in the power that comes. But then I want us to turn it around as we close tonight. So as this ends we see the battle over before it ever started. Now, there's a lot left. This isn't the end of everything. We've got a few more chapters to go. We still, see, we still have judgments and other things to come, uh, all this stuff. But I want us to go back and look at the Word of God for a second. And I won't keep you long here on this, but here's what I want us to understand. If the Word of God, Jesus Christ, proceeding out of His mouth, is powerful enough to destroy everything and every person is there, if it is powerful enough to cast demons out with a word, if it is powerful enough to create the world, then I have a question for all of us. Why don't we use God's word in our lives more? You may be going, wait a second, what do you mean God's words? Well, we have God's words ready and available for us at any time. We live in an age today where really, honestly, there is no excuse not to have God's words before you. And God's words is the Holy Bible, the word of God that he has given to us through man. And if his words are so powerful that they can do all of these things, why don't we in our lives allow his words to work in our lives? Peter tells us that we should defend ourselves. How do we defend ourselves? With the word of God. We defend ourselves with the word of God. With the word of God we can stand up to those forces that come up against us. Not because of what we do, but because of what God does through His Word. His Word is a weapon for you and I that we do not use in our lives because we like to add to it, we like to take away from it. But what we need to do is we need to trust in the power of God's words because God's Word is the most powerful tool that you and I have. Okay, You and I notice that when, when we come back with, from, to heaven, from heaven with God, with Jesus Christ, we're not carrying any weapons. We don't have a sword. We don't have a bow. We don't have arrows. We don't have a gun. We don't have a tank. We're riding on a white horse behind Jesus Christ. Why? Because we don't need anything because we have the Word of God going before us. And guess what? That same Word of God can go before us today if we'll let it. But I think sometimes we're a little afraid we're a little hesitant, or sometimes we like to put our own commentary in there, our own opinions in there, instead of just having faith and trust in the Word, the power of the Word of God. And so as we see all about this battle, we see Jesus Christ coming down. What we see is we see Jesus winning everything with a single word. And with a single word... Jesus can go before us and help us with what he's tasked us to do. And that is to tell others about his power, his glory, his love, his salvation. And so I think what we need to do as we read this, we need to feel pity and sorrow for those who have not found Jesus Christ because we see the end. We're going to see the end for everybody later. We see the Antichrist and the, 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 the false prophet cast into the, the lake of fire and the brimstone. 
But that's going to be the same judgment that those that don't know Jesus Christ will find. And that should lead us to say, what can we do to make sure that nobody sees that and nobody gets that? And what we need to do is we need to rely on God's word more. We need to rely on his word in our lives. Take the promises that he's given us in his word and call upon God to live those promises out in our life. And trust in him that he will go before us and that he will help us. And so as we come here tonight, as we come to a close, I just ask this. Put faith and trust in God's word. Put faith and trust in his word and let him go before you and help you and conquer for you tonight. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. And Father, we do trust you. And so help us tonight with that. Father, we've seen this final battle that really isn't a battle. It isn't a war that is waged. It is man foolishly and arrogantly thinking that they can conquer you. But Lord, we know what's going on today. We know that there are men on this earth that believe they are greater than you, that believe they can conquer you. Lord, there are men on this earth that want to take your people and destroy your word. And so, Father, I ask tonight that you help us to rely on your word for those things. Rely on your word for the help that it gives and the power that it gives us. And, Father, just let us go out and be witnesses for you in all that we say and do because of what you have done for us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.